Hello, hello. Ron Kalish caught me looking over here over at my Facebook page. Uh, happy Wednesday. Uh, today is Wednesday, March 10th, just a couple of minutes uh, past uh, 1230. Uh, let me do this. Let me jump over to uh, my page and let me ensure that we're coming in. Let me do a refresh. All right, looks like that is working. Now bear with me as I check one more thing. All right. Well, I hope you all are having a good day. Uh, I tell you what, uh, this year has uh, it has not let up. It's been nonstop boogie. Uh, I've participated in some different uh, group discussions with integrators and uh, one or two with manufacturers, and uh, it seems to be the theme that uh, most businesses are are super busy right now and they're they're busy at the the contractor level they're busy at the manufacturer level a lot of the volumes folks are seeing and i'm speaking primarily this is you know data or maybe some input as it relates primarily to north america if you're out there around the world listening or watching um i don't know if you're seeing or feeling the same but uh it's full tilt boogie and uh it's good stuff but that said, lots of meetings, lots of lots of good, fun, exciting things happening around here. Um, I am going to mention, uh, and I want you to uh, tune in to our social platforms. So you could find this on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter. Uh, we are going to do uh, a webinar. So we haven't done many webinars yet this year. Uh, I've got to think about it. I don't know how many we've done, but it hasn't been many. And uh, But Josh Stremko and I are going to be doing a webinar tomorrow. We're going to do it on branding. So it's uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. I've, I've spent, it's going to be new material. Uh, spent the last week or so pulling that content together. And uh, we're going to have a fun, action-packed 30 minutes. And, uh, and then we're going to do a 15-minute Q&A. And uh, we'll also be joined by Kendall. For those of you that know Kendall over here at One Firefly, she'll be uh, also joining us. Uh, she leads our uh, digital media team, including our, our graphic designers and web development. So she'll be there to help with Q&A. Uh, if you're out there watching, listening, uh, give us a like, give us a share if you, if you feel so compelled. Uh, drop down into the comments. Let us know who you are and where you're coming from. I see that I've already got a comment here from Jordan. He says, uh, really excited to be listening to this one. Hi, Ron, and welcome, Mark. Well, there you have it. So Jordan is letting you know our guest. So our, our guest today uh, for show 160 is uh, the one and only Mark Coxon, currently sales director at Tangram Technology. So... Uh, Mark's a super interesting guy. I've known Mark for many years, uh, going back many moons. And uh, frankly, I've been trying to get Mark. Mark's a well-known podcaster, personality in our industry. He stood on many a stage. Um, and, uh, and I was super excited to, to find that he, he made some time for us and joined us here on the show. So without further ado, let me go ahead and bring in Mark. Mark, how are you, sir? There you go. Uh, I'm doing awesome. I'm doing awesome. I'm I'm loving the um, I'm loving the red. Nobody can see this, but I'm loving my red live window. In in commercial AV, sometimes people get uh, people get confused. They think the red is mute, but from broadcast, red is live. So you have to know that. Do you come from broadcast, or how how do you know that? Because I I'm not. I don't even think I knew that. Oh really? How, how yeah. You, so. Yeah. I actually you know I learned that when I was at Vaudio because um, I was at Vaudio, which is a camera, like a video conferencing camera manufacturer. 
and we would go to shows like, um, you know, a lot of our integrators were commercial integrators. They were doing like conference rooms and things like that. And red is mute, right? Red, if, if your speaker is on red, it's mute. Um, but then when we, uh, when we go to broadcast shows like NAB, National Association of Broadcasters, you notice that like all the video switchers and things that do this, green is preview, green isn't live, green is what you might be putting up on screen and red is what's in the live window. So, and if you remember the on-air light in a studio is the red light on air, right? So yes. we have two yeah. different, two completely different versions of what people think red means. Some people think it means stop and some people think it means go. <laughs> that, that, is, that is funny. No, that's so accurate. So thanks yeah. for pointing that out. Mark, what, um, want to learn about, first of all, let's, you're the sales director at a company called Tangram Technology. Who and what is Tangram Technology? Uh, Tangram Technology is a division of a, a larger company called Tangram Interiors. And the long and short, uh, Tangram Interiors is a workplace furniture uh, company. They do custom furniture. They're a steel case dealer. Um, and then I am the sales director for the technology group within that company. So obviously, if somebody's building a workplace, um, they need tech to go on top of that furniture. And that's what we do. Awesome. I, uh, I'm going to go completely tangential here. I have a, a problem with my email at one firefly and that I have an absolutely uncontrolled inbox. And so I've over the last several weeks, I've been uh, mindful uh, tackling it on the weekends actually to try to reduce my inbox down to something mm -hmm. less than 40,000 emails in my inbox. I'm now at 38,000. I'm very proud of myself. And I was going through, so what it means is I filter it by time and I actually went back to way, way back machine. I actually found some emails this weekend from you from like 10 years ago. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. So you and I have known each other a, 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 a little while and uh, I've envisioned or kind of seen you as more of a commercial audio video guy. And I've always been kind of a more residential audio video guy. Um, why don't you share with our, our audience, just your background, you have a very diverse background, um, and it's, it's brought you to a lot of fun places around the world and in a lot of different roles. Um, fill, fill us in, help us understand how you, where you started and how you landed where you're at today. Yeah, that's, a, it's such a, it's such a weird, a weird thing. You know, like I always tell people, I never thought I would be in technology. I wasn't the kid who took apart his radio or uh, rebuilt the TV set to his parents chagrin, you know, like on the weekend or anything like that. Um, you know, I, I always wanted to be a veterinarian and specifically I wanted to be a veterinarian in a zoo. Um, so I was going to school for zoology and uh, in fact, I started in biomedical engineering. I went into the zoology program and uh, was on a track to do that. Uh, met my wife and I say I needed to get a real job. Um, at the time I was waiting tables through college and I needed to get a real job to, uh, to support my wife and pay for our wedding. And I ended up working at IBM. And uh, they put me on the phone talking to IT managers and why they hired a waiter who had never worked on a computer to talk to IT managers. I'll never know. Like, I don't know the logic in that hiring process, uh, but they did. And within a couple months, I was the lead on my team. And this was before Google, you know, um, this is when you actually had to use like Alta Vista or some of those old browsers that <laughs> were out yeah. there. Um, I mean, I was, I was going site what is dot com and typing in what is ram because i didn't know you know the training at ibm didn't teach us that it taught us how to search the inventory system for part numbers that's what the training was about but then when you're talking to it managers they're asking you all sorts of questions so luckily i was innately curious and i liked to know the answers to questions so the first time i would say i don't know but i'll find out and then i would go find out and interestingly enough one of my friends that went training with me he left um, a couple years in and went to an audiovisual company and a couple months after that they needed somebody new and uh, he called me so that was my foray into audiovisual was one of my friends pulled me out of IBM into a residential integrator so I started where you're at Ron like I started in Arizona in 2001 through 2009 through the housing boom and then the housing bust uh, I did residential and I worked uh, for a company that did in Arizona all of uh, brothers. Horn and a lot of Shea homes. Um, and at peak, I think we were doing 
you know, 2000 homes a year in that company, like with structured cabling and security and central vacuum and all of those things. Um, and wow. so for me, I met a ton of people. I got to talk a lot across, I guess, across a wide demographic from active adult to brand new first time home buyers about what they wanted to do in, in homes and how they use technology and how it affected their life. And after the, after the housing market kind of collapsed, I, I stayed in Arizona a couple more years, but in 2009, I had a chance to move to California and start with an AV company that did museums uh, and visitor centers and very experiential AV. So I did that for a few years, um, ended up on the manufacturing side with Chief Daylight Vadio, which was Milestone AV, um, which some mm -hmm. of your resi people know as well. And then uh, ended up at Barco, which is uh, projectors and wireless sharing and I uh, pulled out our code be back here on the integration side now in commercial doing workplace so I've kind of been through that residential experiential manufacturer and now more straight commercial so I, I guess I guess if there had to be a next iteration I'd have to be like a roadie on a live event or something that's right. the side of AV <laughs> I haven't worked yet to get the full perspective to get the full thing who, who's a typical customer for you? So you're running sales. Uh, I'm assuming that means sales and design for the systems you guys are specking out. Uh, like who are your customers today or what, what are the types of entities that would be your customer? Yeah. So we do, you know, we right now, like our main customers are private higher education, um, biomedical companies, uh, a couple, a couple hospitals like mission driven hospitals. Um, those type of clients, I kind of boil down the people that I work with. They they usually have a couple different minds. They're either um, highly design centric, like they have a look and a feel and a culture, and they want their technology and their space to mirror that. And stuff out of the box just won't fit the bill for them. Um, they're growth minded, meaning they're just going so fast that they're not going to take on in house projects. They're not going to take the IT manager and turn him into a team, Microsoft Teams expert, because they don't have the time for that. They're growing very quickly. Or they're innovation minded, meaning they could do that. Maybe they're not going so fast, fast furious that they couldn't repurpose people. But the main core of their company is innovating somewhere else. So why would they take their eyes off the prize of that innovation towards, you know, uh, the human genome project or something like that? They're not going to retrain their people to do AV. And so they're people that are looking for an expert to help them accomplish, you know, some of those goals within within those. What is for some of our listeners, um, it would be helpful if you described in your own words, what's the difference if I say I'm using these generic terms that I know I throw out all the time, residential integration versus commercial integration at a high level, how, how are those two spaces different? Well, or are they obviously, different? Are they the same? Right? And it's just two different types of customers. What, what are the differences that are obvious to you? So there are a couple things. Um, I would say, you know, on a human level, uh, residential integration is much more personal. It's somebody's home. It's the largest investment they've ever made. It's something that's very personal to them. They know exactly how they want to use it. Um, they're the people who are going to be living in it and they know what they do. They know how they entertain. They know like what kind of music they like to listen to. They know what their kids do in the house. They know how many TVs they are going to need. They know that stuff. So they know the environment intimately. Um, and they're looking for a high level of touch, someone that they are comfortable with having in home. Right. Um, all of these things come into play. So if, if I was to say if there was any one skill set that commercial could learn greatly from residential, it's that interpersonal communication mm. and that very personal touch to something that's there. On the commercial side, you know, systems sometimes have to be much more scalable. Right. Obviously, if you're going to do this 100 times, how do I now manage that? Do I need networking skills? Do I have to network things to get? I mean, there are a lot of things that start to come into play, scalability and support. You know, what's the service level agreement? How do I get a technician to 18 different offices within a two hour period, as opposed to just to someone's home if they need some help on the weekend? So I think those are the main kind of business level differences in, in the piece. And I think, you know, that maybe is one thing that residential could learn from commercial is, is how do I make something? thing that's scalable, maybe on the 
significant. And I think we're seeing that a little more with how they manage multiple homes or manage systems through like some type of backend platform um, through their automation provider or whatever. But I think those are kind of the main two things. I mean, the technology, honestly, I mean, we've, we've talked about this in the past. Technology is technology. Is, is there a difference between, you know, the, the really high end Wharfdale speakers and, you know, QSC architectural speakers that go on the ceiling? Of course, there's a technical difference between those two things. You have that. I think those things are easy to learn. I think the harder thing is making those switches because what I see a lot is, you know, you'll have a, a residential integrator that has a really good client who owns a business. And then that client asks the residential integrator to do their business for them because they did their home. But the needs of the business from an IT perspective and things may be different than what that person is used to, I guess, providing. And then on the same opposite level, you know, somebody say, well, the, these guys did my conference rooms, come do my house. They come do the house and they do it to kind of a good enough standard and not to like that very personalized approach to how do I design this to really make them happy? Because purchasing sometimes takes the joy out of AV, right? Like the purchasing department can suck all the, all the relative, all that kind of subjective value we, we sell in residential. Like this sounds better because to your ears, you like the sound, you like warm sounding speakers, right? So, so I have a question. For, for me, that's a big thing. Yeah. So I, I was listening to uh, this week, I was listening to the CDA podcast and they did a special on speakers. And so there were a bunch of, you know, thought leaders around speakers. And I don't know a lot about speakers. So I was tuning in to learn about speakers. I, I was sure. a little disappointed. I'm not going to lie. It, it was not speakers. They were only talking about home theater speakers. Okay. And I was kind of thinking more about, well, what about two channel apps? Anyway, so I didn't get what I thought I was being sold as the subject matter. But let's put that gotcha. aside. Yeah. What I did learn is uh, one of the speakers was talking about in the pro world or commercial speakers, for example, are very spec specification driven. The detail, the room, and, and I don't know if this is true. So I'm, I'm posing this to you. Is this does this seem accurate? Is that the selection of gear? And I'm using speakers as a, an example of gear broadly has a set of specifications and the engineer or the designer will be meeting a specification and they will make their selection of hardware based on the parameters, you know, the ones and zeros and the, 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 the details of that particular piece of gear. Whereas in the consumer world, a lot of times the speakers are beautiful, like physically beautiful, attractive. They, they, there's a tension from a design and marketing standpoint to how the speaker looks. And if you look at the speaker specs, often there's like minimal specs compared to what you'd see in the pro world. Yeah. And I thought that was a really neat example of, of maybe how more of the commercial world is specification and engineering driven versus the residential world. But I don't know that that's the case. So I just, I'm lobbing that to you. Does any of that jive with kind of your experience in both worlds? Uh, yeah. So yes, I, I do believe that is is somewhat the case. I mean, when we look at, let's say you're trying to coverage a, you know, you're, you're doing an audio system in a, uh, in a banquet hall, right? So you're just looking at, okay, these, these speakers are going to be, you know, five feet away from people's ears. They have a 90 degree coverage pattern. I want to do center to center coverage. I need 15 speakers and they need to cover this frequency range. Okay. So you've done that. Maybe you go as far as doing like some type of model of the space, an ease model or something that'll show you what the, the difference in pre sound pressure level is from point to point right within the room and make sure it's even. And then we also talk about a spec called STI in commercial, which is the speech intelligibility index, right? Which is their speech transmission index, sorry. But it's intelligibility. It's like, you know, if somebody speaks, do what, can I understand what they're saying? You know, because in a church, big space, you could speakers there, but you might with the echo not be able to hear exactly what's being said. So they have a way to measure that as well. So you go through all this. So the, here's my problem with that. So if you wanted me to say, I say, yes, I think you're right. But here's my problem with that, is that we have taken something that's subjective, which is how people hear. Now, anybody in home theater, anybody who's done residential on here knows I could, sh I could show 15 different people, 15 different speakers, and they're all, all going to pick different ones. 
just works. Now, objectively, they all have different specifications. And if you're putting them down on a piece of paper, you may be able to rate them and rank them and say, well, everybody should think this one is the best based on what it is. But there is something very psychosomatic about the way we hear things, right? And everybody has a different preference, different sound range, et cetera. So here's the thing. I go in and I tell a, cli a client, look, I've done all this I've done all this beautiful math on your space. And these are the kind of speakers you need. And this is the kind of coverage pattern you need. And we do all that and we come in and the client comes in and receives a space and says, I can't hear it and I don't like the way it sounds. Now, did we do our job? This is where I get into a very weird well, thing so in commercial. What's normal in commercial? I'm hoping or thinking it, you would have to at some point have included the customer into a discussion around what they want to hear or educating them. If we do it this way, it sounds this way. And if we do it that way, it sounds that way. Because that's definitely what you're going to do in the residential world. Yeah. Is that happen less in the commercial world, perhaps? It does because usually I don't want you have anyone to throw tomatoes at you or for you to get any nasty tweets after this this interview. So be careful <laughs> no, it, it with does. what you say. <laughs> you no, know, you have that decision tree, right? So sometimes it depends. It depends on how involved or how uh, involved the customer is in their buying process. Many times, the customer is have bought this specification maybe from a consultant or somebody. They believe it's the right thing to get. I, we don't know as an integrator where where that's been dropped and you fill out the spreadsheet and you win the job and you install it and and they don't like it. Um, or if you're even on the design build side, maybe you don't have access to the people or maybe you have access to the wrong people. Like you have access to the IT manager, great. And he says, well, that sounds good to me. Okay, well, when the CEO comes in and says he doesn't like it, then that's the conversation. So I'm always in this kind of like gray area. You know, some some folks say, well, we met the spec and because we met the spec and we installed what we said, um, we should get paid and we did our job. And I'm somewhat of the mindset that says, you know, the customer doesn't know what the spec means. When they bought, they didn't buy 89 dB in a speech intelligibility of 0.8. They bought a system that they thought was loud enough to hear and to understand. And if they don't get loud enough to hear and understand, I think we failed. And some people don't like my subjective view on that, but that's my very people centric side of it. And so this is why I'm a huge, I'm a firm believer in demoing as much stuff as I can for people. It costs me extra money. It costs me extra time. It costs me coordination with manufacturers. But as many times as I can get equipment in my hand and get it into a customer space and start to let them experience things, mm -hmm. um, the better. And I think we've all had that experience, right? You buy something on Amazon that you think is awesome, you get it in your house, and it's terrible. Like sometimes you have to see it before you know it's good. And, uh, you know, for something like as subjective as sound, uh, I say, you, you know, you might want to let somebody hear it before you go forward with, with your design. <laughs> well, that's, that makes a lot of sense. I'm going to give a few shout outs here. Jason says, uh, welcome to the show. Where in SoCal do you reside? I'm a local LBC guy here. Uh, Long, is that yeah. Long Beach? LBC? Yeah. He, he's down. I was down at Seal Beach last night. Um, having dinner, actually Sunset Beach at Fish Camp. So uh, yeah, I know that area over there. I live in Rancho Santa Margarita. So I live in South Orange County, a little more towards San Clemente, San Juan Capistrano, but I know exactly uh, where Jason's at, so. Awesome, then we got uh, Alan, he says, uh, awesome show. I, I, how can I not put that on screen? Uh, thank you, We Alan. love that, yeah, Dro I'll, I'll take show's it. Show's over, Mark, that, we gotta <laughs> conclude it there. It, it, there's nowhere to go but down. Don't um, ruin it. No, don't. Uh, yeah, well, leave, leave it to me. Give, give me a few minutes. Um, Mark, what's changed? Uh, I'm going to ask uh, uh, maybe a question. You could take a bunch of directions. But I know that Resi, it, Resi AV and integration generally in North America is doing really well. And I, I want to say generally commercial, certainly in 2020, was pretty thoroughly depressed. Um, I don't know exactly how it's actually doing now. Is it rebounding here in 2021? And you know, what's changed? And how's the outlook? I mean, what's the future, let's say, you know, the rest of this year, the next couple of years look like? And then I want to get into yeah. some of the changes in the workplace. But I want to talk just yeah. kind of high level business first. Yeah, I mean, obviously, everybody got thrown into work from home last year. And if they weren't used to doing that, that was a little bit of a transition. Um, the I think the plus to this is we've been preparing 
for this world for 10 years. You know, the soft codec platforms have been around quite a while. I mean, I was telling you earlier, I was using Zoom in 2013 to report a, to record a podcast. So, you know, although Zoom may have been something somebody used for the first time last year, it had been around eight years, you know, um, and doing well over that time, but not on the ramp that it was obviously after everybody had to go home. So these technologies- like last year. <laughs> it a hundred percent. Yeah. That exponential, that exponential growth. Right. So, you know, I think the great part was, I, I mean, the, the only surprise for me was, is how well all the platforms were at getting server space to field, to, to run calls. Right. Cause I mean, if you're doing, you know, I think zoom had a 200 X increase in traffic. So if you, if you just put a 200 X increase on, tra on your network traffic at work, what, what happens? It crashes. Right. And somehow they avoided that. They were able to scale that in a really cool way. So I'm sure Amazon Web Services or Azure or somebody in the background was really scrambling to make sure they had access to, to bits and bytes to, to move phone calls and video calls. Um, but that, that worked relatively well, honestly. I think most companies were surprised how well their transition went into remote as they had to. From what I heard, most commercial integrators were down, you know, in that 25, around 25 to 30% last year, which, which makes yeah. sense. We lost a good, we lost a good three months, which is 25% of the year um, where just nobody was really doing anything. And uh, of course, companies like Logitech and Zoom, some of those companies had really good months in those three months, right? Like the supply chain broke, like that was the biggest thing that happened in our industry. You couldn't find a hundred dollar webcam anymore. You know, they were selling $90, $90 Logitech webcams on eBay for 500 bucks because yeah, that's what people were wanting for their house. I almost so. entered that market. I'm not going to lie. I, I dove through my <laughs> closet over here and I put my whole array of cameras I have. I was like, do I go put these on eBay? And I actually refrained from doing it because I thought maybe my team, you know, we have yeah. you know, over 50 people now. I was like, you know, they actually might need cameras and we might not be able to get them. So let me just keep the cameras and send them out to my team. But that, the, yeah, the that, entrepreneur in me said, I might be able to make a buck here on these cameras. <laughs> yeah, you probably could have too. So, I mean, that that part that part escalated. What we've seen, we are seeing some return. Um, now, the, the kind of biggest places that we saw business start to pick up right away was, was education, honestly, uh, because everybody had to get ready for remote learning. Um, you know, schools had to make sure that they were ready to teach remotely because they weren't going to be able to go back full time. Universities really started investing in in remote learning in every classroom or, you know, and even some higher end systems in every third. Um, businesses started to build studios because if you're not going to have, uh, you know, people into a showroom tour, maybe now you actually need to build a broadcast studio to do webinars and all the things that you used to do in person. So we saw some of those short term solutions pop and then things kind of slowed down a little bit. You know, I think people are looking for somebody to lead. And when you hear, you know, Google or somebody say, well, we're not going to bring people back until September of 2021 into the office space, then other companies hesitate. And so depending on their business, now some companies are very manpower intensive. I mean, part of our company is delivering furniture, right? So those people can deliver furniture only. They need to be in the warehouse, loading trucks, receiving shipments, doing things. So those people have to go to work. Um, so I think businesses have returned to the extent that they have to, uh, but we've seen we've seen a pause still. So on the aerial, I'd say you know I think I think there's according to NSCA, the National Systems Contractor Association, I think they said there's supposed to be a 17% increase in construction this year over last year, but that still mm -hmm. doesn't get us back to 2019. Okay. Right. So we're still going to be depressed under 2019 on the commercial side this year although we'll have a better year than last year. That's what it looks like. So, hey, it's on the upslope. What can, what else can you ask for? It's on, hey, a, it's on a positive I, grade. I, I think we'll take that all day long. Um, yeah. What's changed? What is your prediction? And I know you have strong conviction around this, around the way humans interact with technology and around technology in the workplace. And I've heard, you know, from a lot of the content I've consumed that COVID was the great accelerator. Accelerating you know, patterns that were already underway and it took what might've normally was going to take 10 years and now it took a year or, or some version yep. of that. What does that mean to you and what you're seeing in the workplace? And, and I'll maybe take it from the first path, which is the work from home. And, and thus, when you go back to the office, do you use the office differently now? Like, so what, what, is, you, what are yeah. you seeing? So I agree with you. I say there was no, no pivot 
was somebody somebody from the passenger seat put reached over and they they placed their foot on top of yours on the gas pedal right that's what happened to businesses somebody accelerated your car without your consent <laughs> you know this is just what happened but you're right the direction didn't change now when we talk about work from home are people going to use the office different 100% um, in fact i i've i've been talking a lot about this and it's it's this thing is that what work from home showed us is that we can do certain things from home. What we should have done if we're small businesses is illustrated what that gap is between the work in the office and the work from home experience. There were certain things that worked really well, and there were likely certain things that didn't work as well. And so if you're a business owner or executive at a company, what you really should be doing right now is a gap analysis. What worked really well from home? What actually may have even went better? What was more efficient? Um, where did we start to suffer? And now, how do we actually use the office to bridge the two, the two together? So, look, for example, I, I work with a company who is, on, you know, we work with a lot of Ernst & Young companies, entrepreneur, and we sponsor Entrepreneur of the Year. So we're working with a lot of these small, innovative companies sometimes. You know, one thing they noticed is it took them, it took them four Zoom meetings to make a decision that they used to make in person in mm. one meeting. Because not everybody speaks up, everybody has different ideas, the way that the, the calendar may work or the way that they feel when they're in the room, it's hard to raise your hand or get a word in sometimes people are talking on a virtual or if you're in the room, you might see Bob shift in his chair or try to get eye contact with the CEO, like I got something to say. On Zoom, you don't know. You don't know who he's looking at, who he's trying to get the attention of, what made him uncomfortable. Did his kid walk by or did he did that sit that those words cause him to stiffen up a little bit in his chair? Is it time to ask for his opinion on something? Those things are much easier to read in person. Um, or I had a company that said, you know, they're, they're an innovative company. So, okay, Ron, at two o'clock, two o'clock today, come to a meeting and be ready with all your creative ideas. Be in creative mode at two o'clock today. And from two to three, your, your brain is in creative mode. Okay, well, you just came out of an accounting meeting on Zoom. Are you in creative mode at two when you come into that brainstorm session? <laughs> no, you're not. not. And, and you probably had a two-minute transition between meetings because people schedule you back to back, right? So when you start to look at this stuff, you go, okay, now where were the gaps? And I think that's really where we have the chance to innovate is if we're going to come back to the office, we need to come back to the office to reinforce teams. We need to come back to the office. The office needs to be a place that inspires creativity. The office needs to be a place that allows us to make decisions in a quick and meaningful way so that the rest of the week when we're at home, we're driving all towards the same goal. The office needs to be a place to reconnect people to purpose of the company and what you're actually doing. Because you kind of forget when you're sitting at your, I'm sitting at my kitchen table, like sitting at your table, kind of forget like what's going on with the other 15 people that you see scrambling around when you're in the workplace, right? Or that you forget there's 40 trucks outside trying to get loaded right now to go places. Um, but when I park in the parking lot, I can't find a place to park. I realize there are 100 people working here and there are 40 trucks trying to get out the gate, right? So I think those those levels of consciousness around what other people's jobs are, around intent of the organization and those kind of collaborative moments, a lot of that happens well in person. And we need to design space where people go, you know what? I'm stuck creatively. I need to go into the office for two hours. Hmm. Or I need, we can't get this decision done. We need to get all together for half a day and we're going to, we're going to do this. We're going to look at this piece. We're going to do that. And when we leave, we're going to have a decision made and we're not going to schedule another zoom call for next week. And I think that's where we're going to find some really cool creative ideas start to happen. Do offices of the future or maybe offices that you and team are designing now, do they look different today than they would have if you had taken that project on? I don't want to say a year ago, because I think COVID started going nuts around March 9th of last year. So uh, let's say eight, you know, 18 months ago versus what you're doing today. Are you finding architects, interior designers, technology designers? Is the product on paper different than it would have been a year and a half ago? I think so. I think it's becoming, I think it's becoming a lot more different, um, you know, so I think there's some short term things that people are reacting to still. I mean, I think once we reach, you know, once we have a vaccinated population and a vaccine and all those things for the short term, you know, COVID concerns, I think some of these things about touch lists and proximity to people in the office and things like that will start to fade. I think that's always going to fade. But um, the way that they are designing spaces, you know, they're really thinking about me and we spaces now in the office. So, you know, 
when I go to the office, is there a space that I can do heads down folk work? And is there a space that I can meet with a team or create a team environment in order to accomplish one of these goals, make a decision, build a team, uh, create a forum, right? And so the people that I've been talking to, the architects and things are really starting to think now about neurodiversity. How do I create different places in the office where people can do different tasks based on the way their brain works? And then mm -hmm. how do I create these places that really reinforce team, reinforce innovation or re I guess, recent purpose and common purpose with the company. And so, you know, it's funny because, you know, Silicon Valley got a bad rap for doing some of this stuff and companies like, well, yeah, that's a luxury, you know, having a, a work cafe is a table luxury. Room it's a luxury, cool right? Table room, yeah. It's cool, it's for millennials, it's for Gen Z, it's for, you know, whatever, we don't need that here. Well, guess what? If you, if you have a workforce that you're trying to get back in the office, you may start rethinking what you need here. Because the office needs to be a destination. It needs to be someplace somebody goes for a reason. Otherwise, we're just going to do this. If there's if there's no difference between the working at home and working in the office, why do you have an office? Hmm. There's a question right there. Why even have it? If if you're doing exactly the if you're doing nothing different, providing nothing different than you're providing at the work at the work from home selection, why would you have it? And so people really have to start thinking about that because companies are thinking about that. They're thinking about their real estate footprints. They're expensive. So if we're going to use base, what are we using it for? Do we need four or do we need one of them? I mean, I think you're going to see some of that too. Mark, I, I know that you're writing a book, although I don't know if you're willing to talk about what you're writing about. So, and I don't even know if I was supposed to say that I know you're writing a book. Um, so, is this, do I just move on to the next subject or is there something no, we could, high level? We, we, no, we well, could talk about that. Very, well, it, you know, for me, this is the thing. Like I'm a human behavior guy. Uh, I, I love animal behavior. My favorite class was primatology and watching videos of baboons, like in their social interactions and how they create hierarchy and how they, you know, like I loved that kind of stuff as a zoology kid. Um, and people are, you know, animals on a basic level. One of my, yeah. one of the cool po podcasts I listened to last week was Jane Goodall talking about how chimpanzees may be the unlock to like interpersonal con communication in the office, right? It was just really cool. Um, you should look it up if you, if you can find it. What, what podcast um, was that? Was that, I know she was a guest on I, Guy Kawasaki's podcast. Yeah, this was, um, this was, I think the Taken for Granted podcast, which is by Adam Grant. It's what, it's a TEDx product, I think. Okay, but it's uh, Jane Goodall on on the work. It was really cool to listen to her talk about it. But um, so, you know, for me, I'm always I'm always trying to think about how do I get technically minded people, people who, you know, a lot of designers, especially technology design, very technically minded. Um, they like to think of things in rules and processes, right? And the soft, squishy science of people is a little hard sometimes to try to think about. So I'm like, well. Is there a way to explain the soft, squishy science of people in more of in some terms that would relate more to people who are more left-brained? And so I came up with this idea of of the physics of the workplace or the physics of the workforce. And you know, I say that any group of people has inertia. So I took Newton's laws, right? Is what I did really. So any workplace or any group of people has inertia. They have skills and habits and ways of doing things that already exist. So how do we see what that inertia is and how do we best leverage it to get a result that we want, right? Um, mm -hmm. The law of acceleration, right? Like it's much easier. I talk about curling in the book. Um, you know, curling, somebody spins the stone out on a path with some, with some spin on it. And the people go along and they either scrub the ice to reduce their friction or they let it go to keep the friction increased. As it slows down, it starts to curl. So how do we go along that path? Getting the stone to go the exact opposite direction, it's gonna be really hard. I gotta bring it to a full stop and get it to go somewhere else. How much friction does that create? Or are there ways that I can do some little polishing and things to create acceleration, to create different movement based on what's already existing there? Um, we talk about equal and opposite. One of the biggest complaints about the open workplace, the open workplace was made to help with collaboration and help with innovation and help people that maybe wouldn't have met before bump into each other because they have to sit next to each other in an open space. Mm -hmm. But the big equal opposite of that is now nobody can do focus work. 
Like how do you sit down and have a private phone call when you're two feet away from the person on the, on the bench next to you, right? So you always have this push and pull of when I do one thing, create an opposite effect, this opposite reactions. And how do I mitigate those the, the best way? And then the last piece I talk about is um, gravity. And it wasn't really one of Newton's three laws, but it's his other piece, the universal law of gravitation, that every ma everything that has mass has gravity. So our workplace needs to be a place that attracts our people. Like I just talked about employees. How do we get them? How is this the center? How do people revolve around the office or around the workplace or the company? Um, so it has its own gravity. Um, retain employee and create all that momentum, but also in attracting talent. Like how are we getting the best and brightest minds to want to work in this place? And how can the workplace tell a story, reinforce a feeling, build culture in a play in a way that people are continually re-energized um, or attracted to be there? Well, and so, what's your? I was going to put give you this comment, uh, Maggie's. Uh, she says, uh, "Can already tell I'd read this book." So. <laughs> <laughs> Th th thank you. Uh, That's good. I'm glad, I'm glad somebody's reinforcing my my little my you know my my goal in my head, and it, I'm trying to write it in a way. So this is the thing: is I, I don't want it to be, um, I don't want it to be uh, professorial at all. I'm not a professor. Um, I don't have an advanced degree in human psychology or animal. I'm not Jane Goodall. I didn't spend you know 20 years watching chimpanzees in the jungle. But what I do have is I've I've worked with thousands of people. I've built home systems for thousands of people, uh, you know, over my the course of time. I've done systems for residential. I've done experiential. I've worked with a museum docent who wants to tell a story around an artifact and get that artifact to inspire the next generation of archaeologists. And how do we tell a story around that to create gravity around that artifact to get people to want to do something different in their life? Mm -hmm. And so I have these varied experiences and you start to together all these stories and these that you've seen or ways that you've helped people unlock something in their life or in their house or in this system. And so what I'm really trying to do is bridge those anecdotes with um, studies that have been out there uh, about human psychology and things, and then um, this general theory. So I'm really trying to weave those three things together in something that's very conversational, hopefully, to the reader, um, as opposed to something that's like a class. So anyways, that's the I hardest part. It's the voice, right? What, what's your timeline? What What is your, you know, I've, I've, I've heard that different writers have different practices or habits that help them get into their writing in order to ultimately meet a, a goal. I think having a goal I've heard also helps. Like I want to have it done by yeah. this date. Do you have uh, some of those um, habits perhaps that are leading towards this thing being done by some particular time frame? Yeah. I think this is where that, the the uh, the saying know thyself <laughs> comes comes greatly into play for me. Um, you know, I'm not I'm not good at having a deadline just to have a deadline. Um, there has to be some purpose behind what the deadline is. Uh, so, like, I, I don't I don't know that setting a deadline for me is something that creates the impetus to get it done. I'd like to get it done. I wanted to get it done. You know, by by now actually. Um, but for me, like the what I've had to do, um, this is just work. So this maybe maybe even gives some insight into the way I work and, and the way maybe other people work too. But for me, like the the easiest thing to get down are the stories. Like these are my personal stories. So instead of writing something in order, I'm going to say, hey, these are all the personal stories that I want to tell in the book about things that have happened in my life or people I've worked with or things I know firsthand. And then the second thing I started to do was write down all the analogies I want to use. Like I talked about curling. I've got one about the Panama Canal. There are a bunch of things that people, can relate to that mm -hmm. aren't really to tech your workplace but lead some insight so get all those down so those are really easy things to get down on paper um, then cross-reference all the all the stuff I want to reference from other places and then weave it together so the last thing I want to do is start copying down word for word some of these paraphrase you know or, or paraphrasing some of these resources that I have to me that's the cataloging and for me that's probably the most boring work so I want to include it because it provides third-party support for concepts that are there that I know are tr rooted in truth and study that I know some people will want in the book. They don't just want an anecdotal True scientific book principles. Yeah. Is that what you're but for, 
Exactly. So I like to bring those in, but that's probably the, I know the ones I want to use and I know where they're applicable. It's just getting those down is actually kind of the hardest. So I think my problem has been, you know, when I started, I wanted to do it from the introduction page to the end page. But that what seems I'm really hard is, to do. I really, it is. So what I'm finding is it's much easier to just get all the pieces down, lay them all out on the table like a big puzzle, and then start to to assemble them together. And that's that's where I'm at right now. So I think it's going to well, go faster now. <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm excited for you and proud of you that you've gotten this far. And uh, I I have uh, not even the first word down for the book that I one day will write. So you're you're miles ahead of me uh, for the two pennies that that's worth. Um. I want to jump subjects here, and I'm just uh, mindful of time, but there's just uh, there's a form of media that you are a consumer of and you're a practitioner of. In fact, you're joining me here on this podcast, so the, the subject is podcasting. Um, and and uh, just to, to put this out there, I'm going to share this uh, with our audience. Uh, for those listening, what I'm putting on the screen uh, is going to be uh, the web pages where people can see the podcasts that Mark actually puts on. So maybe we'll start there, Mark. What are the podcasts you currently run? And then I'd like to get in just the high level subject of podcasting and kind of what, what do you think it means and where do you think it's going? Yeah, so I've done a few over time. Um, I think I cataloged this on Twitter one time. All the all the different projects that I've that I've tried over time. So I guess the the moral of that story is try a lot of things and find what find what works. You know, selling AV is one that I do rather regularly. That's on Rave Publications. If anybody ravepubs.com, um, selling AV is a five minute or less podcast, and it really just takes one concept um, from kind of a sales perspective. Um, and throws out a piece of advice and a couple of little anecdotes about how the advice may work in your business. So if you have like four or five minutes, this is super digestible. Or if you're looking for something to throw in like a sales training at your company or things like that, I'm super open. I did a whole, I did a series on cold calling. I've done them on uh, value propositions, on uh, handling objections, like all those kind of things. And it's just real quick, four or five minutes um, here and there. But that one's fun to do. Uh, it's really easy for me. It's stream of consciousness. I record it on my iPhone on voice recorder uh, in one take, and I send it to Rave, and they put some bumpers on it and go from there. So uh, that's one that I do. And the second one I do is um, right now is one called Daybreak, which started as AV Daybreak, actually, because um, everything I thought everything I did had to have AV in it. Um, I found <laughs> out it really doesn't. And... What I found out was uh, Jared Hillman is a business owner. He owns an integration, a commercial uh, audiovisual company in Canada, in Regina, Saskatchewan. And he just opened uh, an office in Winnipeg, Manitoba. So uh, he and I sit down and we talk about this. I'm, I'm a sales director, he's an owner. And what really we talk about is just um, general business kind of practices, how we build teams, how we create vision, um, more of those type of things. And every once in a while we bring on a guest. So you know, we've had, I've had guests anywhere from like a change, you know, a director of change at an architect to somebody who runs adult learning at a vocational school all the way through, you know, AV engineers or people like that. So um, that one's fun too. That one's weekly by weekly depending on the month. So how, how did you discover podcasting? Did you discover it first as a consumer of content or did you, I mean, because you're pretty well connected throughout the industry, did you just get invited on and that's how you discovered the format? It's the latter. So yeah, I, I, I did just get invited on uh, a podcast. I think my first podcast I was invited on was in 2013. It was my, it was my first Infocom. Um, and I go to the commercial side, uh, and I went, uh, I was working for Milestone AV and I went to, I went to Infocom. And yeah, that was the first one. I'll, I'll tell you though, the way that I got introduced into social communities in general, if people want to know how to, how like to build kind of that presence, um, honestly, it was just contributing. So I think it's a really funny story, you know, if, for anybody out there that's listens to you, that's on the Resi side, you know, CE Pro is, is the residential magazine um through new bay media and i used to read ce pro a lot and ce pro used to have something called the ask a pro forum online 
And people say, hey, I'm doing this new home thing. How do I get Roku to work through, you know, this soundbar or whatever? And I would go on there and I'd just answer questions. So I was answering questions in the Ask a Pro forum. And then I was commenting on articles. So I read an article online and put a comment. And what I found out was eventually, like I had more to say than two lines in a comment. And so at the time I started a blogger account, that's before Google bought blogger. This was back in like 2009, 2008, somewhere around then. Um, and what I would do was if I had an extended thought, I would write it down. I'd write 400, 500 words down in a blog format and I would just link it in the comments. Like, hey, little too much for me to get into here, but if anybody wants to know my thoughts, I posted them here. Um, because it wasn't a commercial link, the magazines didn't delete them because it wasn't like, go here for Jimmy Choo Shoes. It was just Mark's take on the article. And I would provide the backlink and do all those things that helped their SEO. So they didn't want to, they, they, they reciprocated, they left it there. And then finally in 2000, I'd say in 2009 or 2010, CE Pro um, owned by Nubay, they were, um, they were going to start commercial integrator. And I just went to a commercial integrator and Jason Knott, who was one of the editors there, came to me and said, hey, you're already writing all this stuff. Do you want to get paid for it? And he approached me as being a paid contributor for Commercial Integrator. And so I did two pieces a month for Commercial Integrator on their content map, one technical piece and one more sales-centric piece or industry aerial. Um, after doing that for about two years, Rave came to me and wanted me to come over there um, and started doing stuff over done over 300 pieces on rave writing from there and then uh because i was involved in the social community promoting things i was writing and doing things like that that's where i started to get opportunities to speak that's where i started to get opportunities to come on podcasts um, to give education at infocom and all those things so i guess the long the short version of that story is get involved in the community mm. in chats and comments and clubhouse now and insta chat room that they did out with yesterday or whatever um, just get involved. Like most of us think we don't have a lot to say, but our person, it's funny. We, we all learn a lot. And Ron, we're, while we were talking about this earlier. Our experience is so iterative. We've learned the things we've learned over such a long period of time and in, in such small chunks that we don't realize that we have this very unique and valuable perspective to share with people that they may have never heard before. I mean, I don't know how many times I've said something where I feel like I just said the most basic sick thing ever and somebody goes wow i never really thought about it that way before we all have we all have pieces of us that have that and so you know just be confident in what you've learned over time get involved in the community and people will start to tell you where they think you have this really unique perspective and then lean in like lean into it and that's what's really worked for me so i uh I think that's tremendous and uh, sage advice uh, for those outside of the podcast. Are you are you going to be on stage, any virtual stage in the coming year that you're aware of? Anything planned or booked? Um, so I am going to um, I am giving a class at Infocom, and it'll be in person in October, supposedly. Um, we, they moved it from June to October. It will be in Orlando, so I'll be close to you, Ron. Not not too far from you. Um, well, if it's if you feel pretty confident it's going to happen, I I think so. I think because vaccine seems to be ramping up, I think a lot of people will be vaccinated by summer. Um, I think you know the ISE show in Europe is they're trying to do it in June still. I don't know that that's a great idea for European travel into Spain, but um, I think with I think with U.S. travel, I think they can do a good show. I don't think they're going to have thirty five thousand people there, but I think they'll do a, a good ten twenty thousand person show in Florida, I think so. Um, I think it'll be East Coast heavy and West Coast light, yeah. honestly, um, yeah. more so than usual. But I'm gonna be on that stage. I'm gonna be with uh, a gentleman named Chris Netto, uh, who works for Stair Marketing, and a, uh, a woman named Camille Birch, who uh, she's a marketing uh, marketing director for a an OEM company that builds like video extenders and things like that. Um, and we're giving a course on personal branding in the age of COVID, like why it's important to be visible when so many people are out of work and how you uh, amplify yourself in a time that you may want to be uh, on the hunt. So. I think that's brilliant. I think those are a, a special set of skills and talents and uh, 
you're a good man. Uh, you and your partner in crime there teaching that course because you know that's those are really good things to learn and be good at, and it and it doesn't happen overnight. You know, so that's that's super interesting. For those that are are still tuning in with us here, uh, what is the best way that they can follow you, Mark, or learn more about you, or or kind of follow and and listen to your I know I follow you on Twitter and sometimes you'll jump on the video and you'll, you'll be raw, running or jogging and you'll give a rant on something. I'm like, what's Mark thinking about now? How, how, how yeah. can they, what's the best way to follow you? So the best way to follow me, I mean, I think, I think the most consistent on Twitter, like you said. So if you are on Twitter, I'm at, and my handle is AV is an audio video, uh, phenom, P H E N O M O A V phenom on Twitter. Uh, I usually use Twitter as my broadcast network. I always, I always say, you know, if there's a link to a blog, if there's a podcast that I'm doing, if there's something going on or something I want to share, um, I'm always active there uh, on Twitter. If you are on Twitter, I would say another place to catch me at least every Sunday, there's a Twitter chat that goes on every Sunday. It's called hashtag AV in the AM. So AV in the AM. It's all one word in the hashtag. Every day, five questions pop up about eight o'clock Eastern time and uh, about 70, 80 people go all day. There's usually anywhere from 4 million to 8 million impressions in that group. So if you're looking to grow your social network, come into AV and AM on a Sunday sometime um, and you'll find a, probably a question or two you like to answer and, and jump in the mix. Um, and then, of course, you can connect to me on LinkedIn. So I'm on LinkedIn as well. Mark Coxon, C-O-X-O-N. Um, I'm pretty active on there as well. My Instagram is personal. Um, that's kicky, no punchy. If anybody wants to go see me playing guitar or punching somebody at Krav Maga, uh, you can go to kicky, no punchy, which was a funny nickname they used to give me in <laughs> kickboxing because I had really long legs and I didn't like to use my hands. So, uh, I was, I was always t teased as being kicky, no punchy. <laughs> so that's now your Instagram handle. Yes. My Instagram handle is, is kicky, no punchy. All right. Well, we will put all of those down in the uh, in the show notes, both on our, our website and here on Facebook. Mark, I want to thank you, sir, for for, you know, gracing us uh, with your present presence and wisdom. And I know you're a super busy guy. I mean, I wanted to have you on the show for a long time. So I'm glad we we finally made that happen. No, this was really cool. I, I appreciate it. I like um I like these opportunities to to meet new folks and do new things. And, you know, although it's fun to have your own podcast, it's, uh, it's a, honestly a good strategy to just, to just be a guest on a, on a lot of other ones too, and really widen, widen your community. So I encourage anybody that was, you know, talking there, especially Jason, if he's in long beach or something like that, dude, let's go have a, let's go have crack shack or some Baba's hot chicken in Costa Mesa or something like reach out, let's get something done. I, I love to meet new people in the area. So. Awesome. Thanks so much, Mark. No worries. Take care. All right, folks. There you have it. Uh, show number 160 in the books. Uh, Mark is uh, hes a brilliant guy, and he's – I love to ask – I'll reach out to Mark and just ask him a, a question about the state of the industry or an opinion on technology, and uh, he never – he never lets me down with his his wisdom and kind of the way he thinks about things. He often thinks about things very differently than I would say myself or maybe different people. He brings different perspectives. That's valuable. You want to keep those people close. So I hope you guys enjoyed this, and uh, I will see you on the next show next week. Uh, we have uh, a whole – I think our next two or three months are fully booked out with guests. So that should be a lot of fun. And uh, I will see you guys next time. I'm going to sign off. Let me uh, give you a reminder here. Don't forget, if you have not subscribed to the podcast, go over to your favorite, favorite platform, whether that's Apple Podcasts or Spotify, and just uh, search up Automation Unplugged. You can find us there. And uh, in the meantime, feel free to visit our website. Give us a call. And, uh, and if you're available, tune in to the, uh, the webinar tomorrow on branding. It should be a lot of fun. I will see you guys next time for show 161. Be well, everyone. Ciao.